Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to everyone joining us on Zoom, Facebook Live, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch. Everyone on the Zoom, except for the speakers, will be muted, so make sure you type any questions you have in the chat. If you are on Zoom, you can ask a question in the chat. If you're on Facebook Live, you can uh, ask questions in the feed, and we'll have somebody take a look at those questions and make sure that we get them during the discussion. Please be aware that the live video feed may be a minute or two behind the Zoom feed. But we'll make sure that we see your questions. First, I'll introduce our guest for today. Stephen Campbell is a lecturer in the history department at Cal Poly Pomona. He earned his PhD in history at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and specializes in American politics and economic history. Campbell is the author of The Bank War and the Partisan Press, Newspapers, Financial Institutes, and the Post Office in Jacksonian America a monograph published by the University Press of Kansas in January 2019. Liam Amara is a history professor from a working class family of union laborers. Liam has worked as a union longshoreman, a union fry cook, and a computer nerd. He later took on a lot of student debt to finish a PhD and has taught college for 12 years focusing on the history of ideas. Liam is the Democratic nominee for US Congress in the 42nd Congressional District in Southwest Riverside County. Liz Lavertu is with us, and she is a mother, a small businesswoman, and the chair of the Spring Valley Community Planning Group. She has been an active volunteer in her community for over 20 years and is running for state assembly to advocate for working families and pushing for ideas and policies that will help shape our education, health care, and environment. The 71st Assembly District is in East County, San Diego, Idlewild, Anza, Valley Vista, Sage, and more. Kate Schwartz has served as a licensed behavioral th health care therapist professional for over three decades and won election to serve as the director, a director rather, of the Fallbrook Regional Health District Board. Kate has spent her career advocating for the health care of all, owns a small business, and during COVID has advocated for increased services for local communities. Kate is running for California State Assembly in the 75th District, which encompasses parts of Inland San Diego North County region and the southernmost reaches of the Inland Empire. Now we're going to start with Dr. Stephen Campbell. Uh, Dr. Campbell, can you please give us a couple of uh, a couple of your thoughts just getting started? Sure. Well, thanks for that introduction, Tisa, and I want to thank everybody for having me. I'm going to start off talking about uh, a recession and go through some ex historical examples. A recession is some sort of prolonged period of weakened economic activity, usually characterized by negative growth and rising unemployment. Informally, and in a non-technical sense, we can describe it as the period that occurs after the bursting of a bubble. So to understand the, the cause of a recession, you need to understand what caused the bubble in the first place. There are some models out there to explain recessions. One that comes to mind was developed by the American economist Hyman Minsky. Minsky emphasized human psychology in explaining bubbles and recessions. To take an example, let's say the price of some commodity uh, would begin to rise a little bit. Investors would see this rising price, they would throw their money into this commodity, and that in turn would cause prices to rise even more. And then you see the development of a positive feedback loop. At this point, Minsky says, a sort of mob psychology takes over. Markets have reached a point of irrational exuberance. The price of a good bears no relation to its actual value. It is a mania. Eventually, the bubble bursts, and the same feedback loop goes in the opposite direction, and that's when you have a recession. For the most part, Minsky argued, markets could be efficient at allocating resources, but you need government and you need a lender of last resort in the form of a, cent of a central bank when things begin to get irrational. So that's a general model. And when these, although that and some historical examples can be helpful, I want to emphasize that each recession is unique. In the 1830s, there was a bubble in the price of land, cotton, and slavery that was amplified by silver coming into the United States. This bubble eventually burst and caused a financial panic in 1837. But that may tell us very little, if anything, about today. Recessions are very difficult to predict with any certainty. You're always fighting the last war, so to speak, so as soon as regulators have figured out a way to prevent the conditions that contributed to the last recession, speculators are already creating a new bubble. So it may very well be the case that recessions are intrinsic to modern capitalism. For the times we're experiencing right now, it might be best to look back at the two greatest recessions in the last 100 years, and that would be the Great Depression of the 1930s and the Great Recession of 2008. 
And indeed, those are the two comparisons you see most often floated in the news right now. In the late 1920s, a perfect storm of events came together to create the worst economic crisis the nation ever faced and a major threat to the Republican system of government that was created by our Constitution. So there was not any single cause of the Great Depression. The stock market crash wiped out the life savings of many Americans and made them more reluctant to spend money. But even before the crash, there were signs of trouble in falling commodity prices, economic inequality, consumption that was based on too much borrowing and credit, and the mixing of commercial and investment banking, essentially taking customers' deposits and gambling them away in risky ventures. Germany, one of the world's largest economies, was burdened by reparations from the Treaty of Versailles, and high tariff rates cut off world trade. Some of the greatest lessons we take from the 1930s in include the creation of new government agencies under the New Deal of FDR. The Securities and Exchange Commission would regulate insider trading, FDIC would lessen the odds of a bank run, so again, it's important to calm people's emotions during a recession, make them confident that their savings are safe in banks. Glass-Steagall would separate commercial and investment banking. The federal government, as we know, can engage in deficit spending when private businesses are unwilling to hire. And you have, in the 1930s, the creation of the modern welfare state uh, that many of us know with Social Security and disability and a Department of Labor that recognizes the, the right to collective bargaining and truly acts as a neutral arbiter between labor and capital. But perhaps one of the most significant lessons I want to emphasize in the 1930s relates to the failure of the international gold standard. This is a system where paper money could be exchanged in gold at a fixed rate. So, uh, for example, one ounce of gold was worth $20.67 in the United States. The gold standard has been identified by economists and historians as one of the chief causes of the depression and one of the factors that made the depression last as long as it did. A lot of people do blame the US Federal Reserve for raising interest rates when it should have lowered them, but in fact, this was related to the gold standard. And that's because raising interest rates was the mechanism by which you kept gold in your country. So you had an absurd situation where unemployment was going up to 15%, and continuing to rise, and yet they were still raising interest rates. Farmers began to go bankrupt, businesses failed, deflation began to set in, and some of those feedback loops began to develop. In theory, there were self-correcting mechanisms in the gold standard, but in practice, it was impossible to get every country to agree to the same rules. Some countries wanted to focus on employment, others wanted to focus on strengthening the currency and controlling inflation. And in fact, that bears a lot of similarity to the problems experienced by the Eurozone uh, in the last decade. There's a graph made by the economist Barry Eichengreen showing that the countries that got off the gold standard the quickest, so that included Japan and the UK, were the quickest to recover. Countries like France and the United States that stayed on the gold standard also took the longest to recover. And you can make a direct link between FDR getting off the gold standard in 1933 and the beginning of the U.S. economic recovery. The U.S. was able to devalue its currency, revive exports, and get out of the deflationary spiral. The proponents of the gold standard hoped that it would prevent inflation and keep government limited by taking power away from central bankers and politicians. But it's during a crisis in which you need central banks and politicians to act quickly. And nor do we consider it desirable to have inflation at 0%, which is what proponents of the gold standard promised. Uh, today, the Fed has a target rate of about 2% inflation per year, but it could easily be 4%. And it's not surprising that today the gold standard is most beloved not by academic economists, but by libertarians and billionaires. Besides those who live on fixed incomes, it's the wealthiest who stand to benefit the most from 0% inflation. And that's because inflation eats into their wealth. So we might think of the gold standard as an ideology of the wealthy. As we think about policy today, we should realize that cheaper cash is helpful for the majority of the population. This is especially true when we consider high levels of consumer debt. If you think about record credit card debt and student loan debt, uh, it's an entire burden to, uh, to, to younger generations, mortgage debt, the gold standard would be the very last thing that we would want to implement. What matters most with, with, with a currency is whether it is used to pay taxes and whether overseas investors have confidence in that political system, not whether the currency is backed by some arbitrary commodity. 
Okay, let's fast forward to the Great Recession of 2008. This came on the heels of a housing bubble fed by unscrupulous practices in the mortgage and insurance industry. These big Wall Street firms took all these mortgages together and they bundled them up into a security. This was called a mortgage-backed security. And within these securities, there were some good loans and some bad loans. You might remember the term subprime loan. And we can think of this mortgage-backed security as the bottom layer of capital. And they were selling insurance on top of these securities and uh, setting up the economy essentially like a house of cards. It was unregulated. And uh, with each layer of capital, you got more and more risk. So remember those subprime loans? Those, the interest on those loans is going to spike randomly. And uh, some of those loans are going to go into default. Uh, people are going to have their houses foreclosed upon. And uh, with that, the house of cards is going to collapse. Unemployment in the Great Recession got between 10 and 11%. It had been over twice as high in the 1930s. But as we know, it took many years to recover, and there are even some sectors of the economy that have never felt a recovery since 2008. There were massive foreclosures. There was a lot of suffering. Uh, the cities of Detroit, San Bernardino, and Stockton declared bankruptcy. How do we respond to the Great Recession? Well, there was some fiscal stimulus passed by Congress. It was reduced to $787 billion, essentially to get the votes of Susan Collins and Olympia Snow. It should have been closer to $2 trillion. 30, 30 to 40% of the stimulus was in the form of tax cuts, and very little was for shovel-ready projects. The Federal Reserve missed the warning signs leading up to the housing bubble, but in retrospect, buying up $4 trillion in assets was probably a wise decision. And while the Fed has expanded its powers recently, its primary mechanism of lowering interest rates tends to benefit Wall Street firms and the stock market, but it is less helpful in directly reaching ordinary Americans. So uh, if you've been following the stock market in recent days, you know that it, it did go down a little bit, but uh, it has come back, and that's because of a lot of the money uh, coming from the Fed and tax cuts. Um, one of the big lessons from 2008 is that the big banks got a bailout, but not the average homeowner uh, who was looking for a principal reduction. And one of the lessons we can take out of the Great Recession is that there was a major problem of deregulation of the financial industry. Uh, Glass-Steagall had been repealed in the 1990s. There was uh, regulatory capture. The, the Wall Street firms were so powerful that they had uh, taken over the agencies that were uh, supposed to be regulating them. So the bond rating agencies were, call, were calling everything uh, AAA, investment grade, when a lot of them were essentially equivalent to junk bonds. There were not enough uh, minimum res reserve requirements for banks. Uh, they didn't verify the incomes of borrowers before taking out a loan. Congress cut the budgets and staff of regulatory agencies like the SEC and the FTC. And uh, one notorious example was that uh, some banks like Bank of America were steering black and Hispanic borrowers into subprime loans when they actually qualified for prime loans on paper. And Bank of America had to pay fine for that, pay fines for that very illegal act. So financial deregulation is part of this larger 40-year project uh, that goes by various names. Um, in, 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 in class, I call it supply-side economics. That's the formal name. But you might know it as, as Reaganomics or voodoo economics. Uh, it has some overlap with neoliberalism. And the promise of supply-side economics was that if you cut taxes, deregulated industry, weakened labor unions, that uh, presumably growth would be higher. More revenue would come into the government, consumers would have more choice, and we would have more prosperity. Uh, presumably, if you help the investor class, everyone else would benefit. With a few notable exceptions, this has been the dominant paradigm in Washington for the last 40 years. So we have had plenty of time to test this theory. In late 2017, Donald Trump signed a $1.5 trillion tax cut. And almost all of that was geared toward the very wealthy. That is supply-side economics in action. We don't have any evidence that cutting taxes leads to more revenue. This was the infamous claim of the Laffer curve. Instead, we've seen deficits explode. What we do have evidence for is greater inequality. The share of income going to the top 1% of earners in the U.S. has roughly doubled since 1980. And if you're curious about seeing more uh, statistics on inequality, I would refer you to the economist Thomas Piketty. 
So the promise of the Reagan paradigm was greater growth and fiscal responsibility, but even by their own standards, this was uh, an absolute failure. Growth was higher during the post-war Keynesian years, and that's when taxes were higher, unions were more powerful, regulations of the financial sector were more robust, and we were investing public dollars in education and transportation. But regardless of all this evidence, the Republican Party still keeps advocating tax cuts. And in doing so, they are showing a real contempt for academic expertise. They are not publishing their arguments in peer-reviewed journals. Rather than they are publishing in the op-ed pages of the Wall Street Journal. And in this sense, they have a lot in common with climate deniers. Okay, so where does that leave us now in the current recession? It seems that there are some pretty clear lessons about avoiding the gold standard and recognizing the failure of supply-side economics. Thanks to the research of the economist Claudia Song, we can now identify recessions much earlier than we could previously. Sometimes we didn't know that a recession was occurring until six months or a year after the fact. But with the SOM rule that was named after her, as soon as the three month average of the unemployment rate goes up a half a percent, we know that we're in a recession. And SOM has also made a persuasive case for automatic stabilizers. We already have them with unemployment insurance. And we can also make them for fiscal stimulus. So what that means is that when the unemployment rate goes above 5%, for example, uh, the Treasury starts issuing checks to people. They've already uh, done that with the CARES Act, but uh, some and, and many others, including myself, um, think that we need to do a lot much more in terms of fiscal stimulus. And the advantage of the automatic stabilizers is that in being automatic, um, Congress doesn't have to uh, rush to get everything together at the last minute. Uh, they can spend more time working on other things. But in closing, I want to urge a bit of caution and humility. I don't personally have all the answers for getting out of the current recession quickly. I don't personally see how you can get people to uh, go back to businesses and spend money without having a vaccine, and that might be many months away. Any lessons that we take out of the Great Depression are going to be somewhat tentative. And that's because remember, as I said at the beginning, the nature of each recession is unique. Both the Great Recession and the Great Depression largely came out of uh, problems in the financial sector, but that is not the case today. And another example uh, showing you how different things have changed over time, in the 1930s, agriculture and manufacturing contributed a much larger share of overall employment compared to the percentages today. So agriculture and manufacturing in the 1930s were over half of our labor force. Uh, but uh, as many people know, we're mostly a service economy today. Uh, today's recession is self-imposed, and I worry that um, getting back the economy to a healthy state uh, is not going to be like snapping your, snapping your fingers. Uh, it is going to take a long time. Uh, so that's about it. Um, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak on this. Thank you so much. That was fantastic and enlightening. Um, now we're going to go to Liam for a couple of thoughts. Okay, so hello again, uh, Liam O'Mara, congressional candidate for the 42nd. Um, I'd like to balance my time here by connecting my background in history and my interest in forward-looking public policy. Because the situation we're entering has many parallels in our past, but also some really distinctive elements. And it's going to take willingness both to learn the lessons of the past and a will to innovate in order to navigate safely to the other side. Now, when people talk about the Great Depression, they often begin with the market crash. And this is understandable, but also wrongheaded, since the economy was fragile for a long time leading up to it. And it is those underlying structural factors which made that depression particularly bad. There are multiple factors, of course, and Dr. Campbell addressed many in, in his segment. Um, so I want to focus instead on some of the positive lessons learned from the Depression and how we've really dropped the ball in the last half century, returning, in essence, to Depression-era economic ideals that have been undermining the American economy. Now, uh, to start with, um, Industrial economies first grow by building capital goods, uh, i.e. what industry needs to build itself further, like factories, roads, canals, heavy machinery, mills, mines, harbors, ships, trains, all that kind of stuff. 
And these are all long-term and highly expensive assets which are designed to generate revenue. But as capacity expands and the need for these investments slows, the economy needs something to absorb all that production capacity. And so consumer markets emerge. The United States was the first country fully to transition from a capital goods basis to a consumer goods basis back in the 1920s. And the timing there is not coincidental. For the first time, production was geared to serve consumers, uh, shifting the entire logic of the economy. At an earlier stage, capitalism could accommodate vast wealth in the hands of a few since capital goods required massive individual investments. Though the Gilded Age itself was fragile and built on horrific exploitation and poverty, but its growth was not so much driven by the spending from below, so its depressions were less dependent upon substantial redistribution in order to recover. Uh, and of course, uh, a larger depression was going to grow more likely anyway, as soon as like Harding and Coolidge worked to lower taxes for the rich even more. I mean, tax cuts for the rich always lead to recessions, but somehow after a century of experience with this, Republicans still don't care. Anyway. Um, so along with uh, the rise of like, you know, um, early 20th century progressivism, the scientific management ideals and Taylorism, like the efficiency experts, their stopwatches, the early 20th century economy also gave us Fordism. And many people remember Ford uh, primarily for helping to perfect that assembly line based upon interchangeable parts. That's what comes up mostly in schools, but much less often taught is a key insight that helped to make the whole consumer economy work. Ford argued that it was no good having a manufacturing system designed to spew out standardized low cost goods if there was no market for them. Consumer production in the 19th century had focused almost entirely on luxury goods for the elite, but that wasn't enough to absorb the capacity of production in like an improved factory model. So a whole new class of consumers had to be found. This of course leads to all kinds of other fun changes like the birth of the advertising industry is in this period as well. And there's all kinds of cool stuff that happens there. But the key element here for us is that Ford decided to raise wages. He reasoned that if he paid his workers enough that they could afford to buy a car, he'd sell more cars. Uh, lo and behold, the automobile industry took off like a rocket and reshaped the landscape of America. It took a while for other business leaders to catch on to the value of paying higher wages, though. Increased efficiency led to far greater hourly productivity, but most business leaders at the time kept that extra profit for themselves. Between 1919 and 1929, when the Great Depression starts, overall productivity went up 43%. But in that same time period, wages went up about 8%. This meant that more goods were available than ever before and more affordably made, but there were not enough consumers to buy them. Now, it took the Great Depression and the strengthening of labor unions and changes in the tax code and the gold standard that Dr. Campbell mentioned there to force businesses to do what was always in their own interests, pay their workers a living wage. And for a while, we had a stable relationship between government and the private sector with just enough free enterprise to see efficient innovation and just enough regulation to see that wages kept pace with productivity gains and the whole economy grew. Um, I want to experiment a little and show some uh, graphics here. So um, the graphic I'm going to pull up here is from the uh, Economic Policy Institute. It's been reprinted in lots of places. You may have seen it before. Um, uh, there's that. Um, and if you see this, you note the sharp divergence between the value of our labor shooting up here and what we are paid for that labor. And you can see about the time it breaks with the rise of like the Chicago school, neoliberalism, the whole trickle down uh, economics that, again, Dr. Campbell was mentioning. Kind of nasty separation here, right? Now, um, the, uh, the right wing economists have countered this kind of argument by saying, well, the price of many goods has fallen due to trade and automation. And they'll point to things like implicit price deflators or the, the personal consumption expenditures. And then if we look at that, we'll see that eh, things have improved. They're not nearly as much as overall productivity gains. Um, and in the PC terms, only by about half as much. But things get even worse when you start to measure based upon consumer price indexing. 
which is probably one reason why it's not particularly favored by them. And when this is used, they often pull still a smoke and mirrors trick. Um, so take a look at uh, a graphic here from, let's see, uh, what this one, I've never shared graphics on this thing before, so it's kind of weird. Uh, so take a look at this, this from the Heritage Foundation. You can see like uh, the top line is the productivity gains, uh, followed by the IPD and the PC that I just mentioned, as you can see those here. Um, but below that are two lines for the consumer price indexing. And um, the first shows does show a gain, although about, you know, a third of what you get for productivity. Um, but the way they, they go about some of this stuff is, well, they do this by measuring your total compensation, which includes the calculated value of all benefits, like healthcare, stock options, all that kind of stuff, without any regard for whether those are a real gain for the worker. Consider healthcare, which comes up a lot in our town halls. Uh, if the real cost of providing healthcare for someone is $2,000 per year, but the company pays $15,000 a year due to the bloated insurance industry, this metric still shows a gain of $15,000 in compensation, even though the employee gets no measurable benefit from that wasted money. Um, but, I mean, it, it take a look at, at, uh, at two again here, and you, you see, like, you know, um, oh, oh, the actual uh, wage gain compared to CPI is uh, pretty awful. Now, the Brookings Institution has uh, their own kind of slightly more nuanced uh, graph here, but still shows a pretty large gap widening here beginning in the 1970s between productivity and compensation. And... The uh, EPI has put out itself an updated graph which addresses some of Heritage's complaints that it focused only on production workers and blah, blah, blah. And it still shows that wages are indeed way, way below productivity gains here, which you can see here. This is where what people mean when they talk about inequality growing in our economy. Now, the, the arrival of Fordism heralded a, a transformation of America into a predominantly middle class nation. And the decline of Fordism since the 1970s has caused that middle class to shrink by 20%, led to major spikes in poverty. More goods than ever before fill our shelves, but we lack the means to purchase them. This in turn caused an explosion in consumer debt. With wages not keeping pace with the cost of living, American families have fallen farther and farther into debt. So uh, take a look at this graph here, um, showing a, uh, let's see, um, that one there, showing a uh, sharp divergence between um, income growth and credit card debt. That's pretty wide right there. Um, this is, again, starting around the time of the Reagan Revolution. You can see where this data from, from 1980 and going up to about the time of the, uh, the 2008 recession. Uh, and then, um, let's see this in a little bit more. Take a look at this graph here showing um, the non-housing consumer debt since about the time of the 2008 recession. Now, um, if the economy was strong and recovering from the 2008 crash, as the media just keeps saying to us, why is it that the consumer debt just continued to rise? And the simple answer is the real economy never recovered. In fact, the bottom 50% of American households have lost a trillion dollars in wealth. The only thing that recovered after 2008 is the markets, so the investors can make record profits while the rest of us get steadily poorer. Uh, I promise I'm almost done showing you images here. I know it makes this a little bit goofy here, but um, I want to make a quick point first about um, our, um, our tax code and how messy this is. It's, it's sort of ridiculous. So let's, um, I want to start with... Um, Zoom makes us so weird, doesn't it? I want to start with the situation here under Truman in um, uh, 1950, and you can see that the, the lowest uh, paid workers here uh, pay a fairly low overall tax rate, and the highest paid workers pay a significant share of their income in taxes. But this was still enough to produce a lot of millionaires. But if you move forward to, say, Johnson's rates, 1964, you can see a steep rise already in taxes on lower income workers, which was needed to compensate for the loss in revenue caused by giving the top earners a nice cut. But growth continued overall in the real economy because the overall rate wasn't yet awful enough and wages had continued to rise. Um, things went straight to hell under Reagan's cuts. So here we are in 1985, and you can see how much this has dropped. Um, and you can also see that the lower and middle 
are getting a real squeeze in order to pay for that cut to the top. Uh, this is also, incidentally, what, uh, um, oops, what caused the explosion in our, our massive national debt. I mean, before Reagan, the, the debt was basically negligible. Uh, but there are hidden consequences to cutting the top rate so much that completely undercut all of those supply side economics. Far from helping the real economy by creating good jobs and investment, real investment plunged while speculation exploded. In the 1960s, speculation made up of about 10% of stock market transactions, but by the 2000s, it was about 90%. And more fundamentally for our, our, our quality of life, the tax cuts lowered wages for most of us. They changed the incentive structure for corporate boards. With taxes so low, the executive compensation could rise from 10 times the average worker to 400 times the average worker. And with less cash available uh, you know, and less incentive to give the workers more, the companies began giving as little as they could to everyone else, hence the break and the, the stagnant wages for 40 years. Um, just to kind of like, uh, I don't know, finish the story at least, and then I won't show any more of these things. Um, this is where we were in, in uh, uh, under W's cuts. This is about 2006. You can see again, uh, a massive fall in what the wealthy are paying. And this is where we were by 2018 under Trump's cuts. And you can see by this point, the wealthy are actually paying a lower overall tax rate than the working class are. Because again, this is accounting for federal, state, and all taxation. It's sort of like keeping the whole thing running. Um, which is just, I mean, in addition to be kind of being kind of unjust, it really affects the overall economy. Um, but you know, I guess lower paid workers don't have as good a lobbyist in Washington, so yay. Now, why do I spend so much time walking you through tax rates and productivity gains and blah, blah, blah? Uh, remember the Fordist principle that I was pointing to? The workers now have far too little income and far too much debt to cushion the economy from a serious setback. And if our spending falls too far, the real economy can crumble pretty fast. Now, um, since I'm using the term real economy, I mean like the realm in which the money sort of circulates to buy goods and services, and it's kind of like separating it from the, uh, uh, the, the ones and zeros flowing around on like screens in the financial sector and Wall Street and whatnot. Uh, but on top of all this, we're seeing right now record levels of unemployment. And for historical perspective, the unemployment rate in 1930 was around 9%. And by 1933, at the peak of the Depression there, it had reached 25%. Have you noticed where we are now? We just hit 24%. We are literally at the level of unemployment in the Great Depression. And with a similar long-term disconnect between wages and productivity and high household debt on top of that. So our ability to keep spending and support American businesses is extremely limited. So... Look at me done. To kind of like wrap this up for me, I want to start pointing to some things we can do to improve things. Um, and here's where I'd like to suggest we kind of borrow a page from Franklin Roosevelt's own taste for experimentation. We're simply going to have to be willing to try some things and see what has the greatest effect. But for all of them, they need to address the real underlying structural problems in the way we've managed the economy for the past 40 years. In particular, we need more cash in the hands of American workers, not in the hands of billionaires. This is the only way to get the spending level where it needs to be for the economic engine to keep humming. So let's start by restoring the ability of workers at all levels easily to organize and unionize, as so many at places like Amazon and Walmart have tried, and because this will help reserve, reverse the decline in wages and make the US economy as a whole much stronger. Next, we could decouple healthcare from employment by passing and improve Medicare for all, because this would improve uh, the, the, the freedom of consumers. It, it would let them choose their own provider and not be stuck in a network. It allowed them to change jobs, lose jobs, start their own business without fear of losing their coverage as so many millions of Americans have now lost. It would save us a ton of money by removing a wasteful uh, layer of private taxes and it'd make us healthier to boot. So yeah, nice bonus. Third, we should create a permanent and generous system of paid sick and family leave for all Americans. Because this would let people take time off when they're sick, which would reduce the exposure of others to illnesses and would boost productivity overall. Had this been in place before the pandemic, thousands of infected people could have stayed home without losing their jobs. Fourth, let's stop the economy from hemorrhaging jobs. The German unemployment rate has increased by about half a percent in the same time here because they're using wage subsidies to let people keep their jobs. 
The collapse in our labor force was a political choice, and it was a dangerously stupid one to make. The cost to rehire and retrain workers is wasted money, and the whole thing is increasing incentives for automation. Early estimates are that up to 42% of the jobs lost here will never be recovered. They're just going to be eliminated. So fifth, let's do something about automation. Complaining about immigration has long been a racist smokescreen for the real job killer, automation. Uh, U.S. actually manufactures more than it ever has, but we do it with far fewer workers. So we need to start taxing the robots and use that money to provide a basic income for everyone. A guaranteed minimum income could solve poverty at last. It could allow people to build up savings again. It would raise our living standards and our consumption levels, and it would compensate for the steady job losses we're going to see in the coming decades. An estimated 47% of American jobs are at risk of being automated away in the near future. Only a fool would ignore the consequences of that rapid change. And to those who would say, what? You can't give people money? I'll, I'll just point out that such programs are never a charity from the perspective of the economy. Social Security allows the elderly and retired to keep spending money, which helps the economy. Welfare benefits to the poor allow them to keep spending money, which helps the economy. You, you see why I'm, I talked about Fordism and the consumer basis for our economy? Four or six, how about a nice quick one? How about reforming the tax code itself, which is a block of Swiss cheese for the rich to navigate with expensive lawyers and an incomprehensible muddle for everyone else. We shouldn't even have to file taxes. It should just be done it's, as it is in every other advanced country here. Um, we only have to file taxes because lobbyists want us to file taxes, yay. Um, so I say let's simplify the process and save the American taxpayer some money. But speaking of money, Let's see some real investment in America again. Remember all those buildings, colleges, roads, bridges built during the Great Depression? I guarantee that you have used a lot of them even if you never noticed the little plaques describing when they were built. And what about the space race and the arms race during the Cold War? Anyone enjoying their computer or smartphone and the internet right now needs to thank direct government investment in new technologies. Per capita, our spending on research and development has been shrinking for years. So how about we invest in a bunch of green industries and climate change mitigation technologies? We could innovate our way out of some of the worst effects of the last two centuries of industrial hubris and restart the American economy at the same time. Eighth and last, I'd like to propose some banking reforms. We should strengthen that sector with a 21st century version of the Glass-Steagall Act that Dr. Campbell mentioned, and we should lower the cost for poor businesses to start by, say, I don't know, maybe opening up public banks. The latter could, in fact, save the U.S. Postal Service since we can easily turn post offices into low or no interest lenders and let them offer many of the financial services. This would provide a massive stimulus to America's small businesses and help to save Main Street. What all, what all these, things, these things have in common is spending. And at the end of the day, we're going to have to figure out a way past the current financial paradigm, which sees government deficit spending as a threat. There may be something to, I don't know, modern monetary theory that's worth our investigation and experimentation, since the alternative is pretty dire. Decades of overspending on top of idiotic Republican tax cuts have put the government so far into the red on the current understanding we're in trouble. But we need not be at all since the whole thing is founded on what is, in all likelihood, a series of false assumptions. Economics is not really a science. Um, but that's a topic for which I have obviously no time. I have uh, greatly exceeded the amount of time I wanted to spend. So I will close by pleading with those watching, if we want to save the economy, we need more cash in the hands of the workers. And to get there, we have got to replace a lot of the people in Washington who don't have the first clue how our economy works and keep voting to make it worse. And let's start by firing corrupt Ken Calvert. So I'm Liam O'Meara for Congress. Thanks for your time. All right, so we're going to go to uh, to Liz next because she has to she has to take off in a little bit. Uh, Liz, take it away. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I am Liz Livertu. I'm running for state assembly in the 71st Assembly District, so East County, San Diego, and the southwest part of Riverside County. Um, thank you so much to uh, Stephen and Liam. Such great information about the history of uh, recessions and depressions throughout uh, America. Um, my focus, you know, and just to lay it out easy, is 
you know, looking at the three R's, they're just as important today as they were during the Great Depression. We need to look at relief, reform, and recovery. So with relief, that's this, you know, current state that we're in right now. The, you know, I don't really feel like everybody is doing a great job right now. Our government, uh, with the relief, the stimulus checks that they sent to us, you know, a lot of people were forgotten in that. Uh, you know, kids ages like 16 to I think it was 24, if their parents claimed them, the, the parents didn't get anything and the kids didn't get anything. Um, you know, and I think that uh, it was too little and slightly too late as well. There was a lot of other countries uh, giving more to their citizens and they called it a stimulus but it really didn't help stimulate the economy since the economy wasn't open. It really went to people's rents, to their basic necessities, their bills, their health insurance, things like that, which missed the reason why we'd want stimulus checks to help stimulate the economy. So I do believe, uh, and I'm hoping Congress will pass another one soon since businesses are now opening back up again to we we could actually stimulate the economy uh, with that money. Um, but so anyway, so relief, um, you know, should obviously be focused on those who are like unemployed or living in poverty, our children and our seniors, not the million dollar corporations and billion dollar corporations, you know, um, so we need to make sure that when we're uh, looking at the relief, we're looking at the relief for the people who are actually hurting during the crisis. And then we need reforms, the second R, reform. Uh, we need reforms to help the people. We need reforms to help small businesses and small business owners. Uh, Liam touched on a lot of them. Uh, Medicare for all will definitely help everybody, including small businesses, to not to have to look at that cost when hiring people on. They would actually be able to pay them a little bit more uh, so people can actually earn a livable wage. And then public banking is something, you know, that I've definitely been looking at for California and putting them into our post offices um, as well, since there's post offices in every community. Uh, it would be an easy way for people to access banking with uh, lower fees, well, no fees and like lower percentage rates as well. And then, you know, as far as other reforms go, we need to create more revenue. So like Liam uh, had shown in a bunch of amazing graphs, you know, we need a more progressive, tax to ensure that we have more revenue coming into um, the state levels and the federal level so that we can invest in things. When the Great Depression happened, uh, you know, uh, the World War II kind of, you know, worked in our favor as far as bringing us out of it, but we need to be focused on peace projects right now. Um, if we can be investing in peace projects, like shovel-ready projects that are ready to go, I know in my district alone, in the 71st Assembly District, there are over five shovel-ready projects where we could get people to work fixing our roads and fixing our infrastructure right now. We also need to focus on green and renewable energy. We can take the subsidies that we're giving to big oil and that money and invest in creating, you know, the energy storage and green and renewable energy for our district and throughout our state. Um, it will create more jobs. We can do paid job training for those who are unemployed um, if they want to look at changing careers since, like Liam said, a lot of those jobs aren't coming back. You know, when, uh, when the economy recovers, not all the jobs are going to be there again, um, including mine. So, um, you know, we really just need to, you know, be focusing on um, our spending. Now, in 2008, and I, I don't think anybody touched on this, but we ended up, um, as a government, uh, cutting back our workforce and uh, more people went into unemployment that way and it really slowed the growth, um, you know, out of the recession. Right now, our legislators are looking at um, the budget and I know the budget's tough right now, but we can't be underfunding schools any more than they already are. We need to ensure that schools are fully funded and maybe even given more funding to ensure that our kids can go back to school. We need to hire more teachers and more support staff in our schools right now. Um, there's a great pool you know, of people unemployed who are looking for jobs. And I know that our government can create jobs in different ways. Uh, you know, Ensuring that our schools are funded is one way and ensuring that we increase the in-home support services um, you know, for those who um, are aging in our community and ensure that they have access to um, health care uh, in the area as well. So those are just some of the things that I'm thinking about, but I'd be interested if anybody has ideas of other peace projects in the area that could help stimulate the economy and create more job growth uh, to help our uh, economy recover, uh, just message me. I believe uh, 
Edison will drop my contact information there. And then I'll stay on for a little bit and hopefully be able to take calls from my car. But I am heading to a protest in my community right now. So hope you guys are having a great day and I will see you again next week. All right, so next we're gonna to go to Kate. Okay, I am unmuted. Again, hello everyone. My name is Kate Schwartz and I am a candidate, the candidate for Assembly District 75, which covers uh, inland North County, San Diego from the southernmost point of Escondido through Valley Center, San Marcos, bit of Vista, Fallbrook, Rainbow, Duluth, uh, the Pachanga and Paula areas, as well as Temecula. Uh, let me speak for a moment about some of the more recent new policies under consideration in Sacramento to address the challenging impact of the pandemic on our economy and jobs and Governor Newsom's recent May revise. First, I would like to highlight some of the input being provided to our state legislature as it considers potential avenues of action. The uh, executive director of the United Food and Commercial Workers stated that the proposals from the California Senate to promote an economic recovery that is based on a collective investment in a better future, not an austerity budget that cuts funding to struggling Californians, is uh, greatly lauded. Workers from this state are in crisis. This is not a time for small fixes. We cannot allow this recession to deepen deepen economic inequality or cause more pain to those already struggling. We need our leaders to fight alongside us for a California where all families can meet their basic needs. And uh, the executive director continued to state that they're so looking forward to working with the legislature and the administration to ensure that working people are front and center in shaping our economic recovery and that we prioritize good jobs and safe communities as the path forward. Uh, in addition, I wanted to take note of a response from the executive director of our County Welfare Directors Association of California. Uh, and this is Frank Mecca. Budget and economic recovery proposals are exactly the kind of bold and creative approaches we need to meet the moment in an unprecedented economic disruption. Just as importantly, the Senate's proposals reinforce the value that must guide California's decisions through this crisis and recovery. And uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and its economic devastation have fallen hardest on the Californians who can least afford it. The lowest wage workers have lost their jobs and their health care. The most marginalized families are struggling the most to hold on to their housing. Too many children go hungry and are afraid. They support the Senate's focus on stabilizing families and preventing homelessness through renter's relief. Uh, the surge uh, in, in demand for CalFresh and CalWorks and other county human services programs in the past number of weeks shows these programs are already vital bulwarks against the worst effects of this crisis and will be crucial to helping families weather the longer term economic storm. Uh, and now I would like to speak a little bit about some of the work that has been going on uh, by Senate leaders. They have been detailing housing production legislation intended to increase the supply of affordable housing and aid California's economic recovery. Uh, and uh, in Sacramento, as of May 20th, um, the policy came out and the discussion about uh, the, the Senate in an effort to spur affordable housing production and aid California's economic recovery due to COVID-19, Senate Democrats unveiled a package of les legislation intended to bolster production of new housing and remove existing barriers by further streamlining the development process. Um, this package of bills will lead to more construction jobs and apprenticeship opportunities that will strengthen the economic viability of working families and the state. And uh, these bills are the product of four months of work by a group of lead Democratic senators designated by Senate uh, President Pro Tempore, Tony Atkins. Uh, at the start of the year, the call, uh, her colleagues and herself committed to developing a comprehensive, successful approach to housing production. 
uh, due to COVID-19 and the economic fallout that accompanied it, accompanied it, they needed to pivot their approach. This package of legislation, Atkins stated, would make more housing production possible, generating high wage jobs for skilled construction workers, uh, even while continuing to work through the new realities of uncertain times caused by the pandemic and economic downturn. And it positions California to leap forward exponentially on affordable housing as times get better. California, of course, had a housing crisis well before the pandemic, and the need is even greater now with the virus ravaging the earnings of working families and the most vulnerable. The Senate's housing package focuses on desperately needed relief for renters as well. It ushers in new solutions to spur smart development by ex expediting the transition of dead and dying malls, and it advances small-scale infill development. Uh, and uh, the Senate uh, housing production package includes five bills, uh, and they are scheduled to be heard in committees in the coming weeks. Uh, as well, and the Senate, uh, there's also a Senate proposal that would create the renter landlord stabilization program that would enable agreements between renters, landlords, and the state to resolve unpaid rents uh, over a period of time. Uh, the housing production package includes the following bills, SB 902 by Scott Wiener. Um, this bill allows local governments to pass a zoning ordinance that is not subject to the California Environmental Quality uh, Act for projects that allow up to 10 units if they are located in a transit-rich area, jobs-rich area, or an urban infill site. Um, Atkins proposed a bill that would expand the application of, it, of streamlining the SICA process to smaller housing projects that include at least 15% affordable housing units. Uh, it would also uh, broaden the application and utilization uh, of what's called the MIRA process, the Master Environmental Impact Report process, stream, streamlining, streamlining, excuse me, which allows the cities to do upfront planning that streamlines housing approvals uh, on an individual project level. SB 1085 by Skinner would enhance existing density bonus law by increasing the number of incentives provided to developers in exchange for providing more affordable housing units to communities. SB 1120 by Atkins would encourage small scale neighborhood development by streamlining the process for a homeowner to create a duplex or subdivide an existing lot in a residential area. And SB 1385 by Caballero, this bill would unlock this existing land zoned for office and retail use and allow housing to become an eligible use on those sites. Uh, it would also extend the state's streamlined housing approval process to office and retail sites uh, that have been vacant or underutilized. Every year, the nation witnesses the closure of brick and mortar re retailers, uh, whether they're large shopping malls, strip malls, uh, and large standalone big box retail stores because of the shift of shopping uh, to the internet. The change in consumer behavior leaves California communities with all these vacant and underutilized retail locations, unused real estate at a time when the state is facing uh, an astronomical housing shortage. So this may very well be one very, very positive use of that land. Um, I also wanted to uh, address uh, the issue of jobs and our essential workers because it has be become increasingly clear that our most essential workers are among those in the lowest paid and most precarious roles and that many in, in many developing economies, in particular basic social protection is missing uh, for much of this formal and informal workforce. Uh, the period after the Great Depression and the Second World War saw the formalization of the weekend and other workers' rights in the United States and the creation of health and income safety nets, as well as widespread, widespread education investments across uh, Europe and the U.S. Yet, as the nature of our economies has changed, laws, standards, and wages have not kept pace with the needs of workers, as Dr. O'Mara pointed out so well. And in many cases, uh, in, as well to businesses, in, in parallel to managing the urgencies of the crisis, it is imperative that governments, businesses, and workers, uh, representatives such as unions, 
work together to lead a new historical shift in upgrading the protocols that govern our labor markets. Uh, collaboration is necessary between uh, employers, governments, unions representing workers, both nationally and globally, uh, in order to uh, achieve recovery. Uh, there was a World Economic Forum in January of 2020, uh, and the topic was reskilling, uh, developing a reskilling revolution platform devoted to improving education skills and jobs for a billion people globally by 2030. Um, they are now dedicating this platform to supporting governments, companies, educators to help workers and students through the crisis, exchange best practices, and to build back better education skills and job systems for the post-pandemic recovery. Uh, the pandemic crisis has exposed more glaringly than ever before the inadequacies and inequities in the systems of the past. Yet it has also refocused the minds of global leaders on the fundamental value of human life, human potential, and human livelihoods. This is our window of opportunity to invest in our most precious asset, of course, our human capital. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to take a few questions. Um, and I'm going to start with one that is a, it's a bit of a big question, but I, I think there's a lot to be discussed here. Um, so the question comes from Facebook. It's, we cannot go this alone, and we may have to ditch both globalism and isolationism in favor of an authentic internationalism. Maybe the way out lies neither in more deregulation, nor in greater Keynesian stimulus, but in finding the way to put to useful purpose the global glut of savings, trillions upon trillions for the idle rich. This could find an international new deer, deal, of course a green new deal. Um, who would like to start? Steven, I see your head. Well, I yeah, I did kind of see that earlier. Is there, is there a way that that uh, um, question can be rephrased? I, I don't know if anyone um, else yeah, found I, that found that question a little bit kind, so, of, kind, of, kind of a lot to handle. Yeah, it's kind of a, a question about finding a middle road, I think. So the idea that instead of going like a, a lot towards uh, isolationism or protectionism, you know, versus just having our completely open markets, what's the middle way that the, is there a middle path where we can get ourselves into a, a, a Green New Deal and make things work? Or, or do we really have to lean more towards one direction or the other? I'm not sure, but I, I think I, I think I saw in that she might have been talking about trying to, get, well, probably like um, a middle ground, but basically like something that goes beyond it, where the globalism now is more like a, a business or corporate globalism, the, the free trade and whatnot, but there's no political unity. I, I guess I, I would make a connection to one of the big problems the European Union has had with its um, uh, financial union is that without the political union, the spending varies, the taxes vary, so it's hard to hold the overall economy together. So I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, and that's a lot of people have drawn similar similarities between the problems of the Eurozone with the, with the gold standard. You know, I'm not sure if it's an either or. I think maybe that question is getting at kind of free trade versus protectionism. I, you know, both uh, Liam and I said a lot about taxes. And I, and, and I think what a lot of us see as the major problem is, as inequality and politicians nowadays need need to not be afraid to raise taxes. Now, now once you start advocating higher taxes, uh, you're going to get a lot of pushback from the other side, you know, so-and-so is going to raise your taxes and businesses will begin to threaten you. They will say, well, if you raise my taxes, I'm just going to transfer, um, you know, my workers and my operations overseas. I, I think that we need to design the policy to, uh, to prevent that, uh, to prevent the, the capital from going overseas. And, and so I, I, I think in that sense, we might need to make the economy more closed, but I'm I'm just I'm I'm kind of skeptical of the of the framing of that question and 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 kind of either or. But um, I, you know I I think dealing with inequality is the uh, is the major issue, and so to deal with that, you need to uh, uh, to raise taxes, um, but also to get money out of politics. Uh, I think I think Citizens United has been absolutely absolutely disastrous. And, um, you know, this is a long-term project. It's not going to be done overnight, but uh, we, 
we need to eliminate the all the advantages in the tax system and through lobbying that uh, uh, that corporations get. Um, I can add something briefly to this because the the whole taxes issue, and uh, Dr. Campbell mentioned raising taxes. One of the thing, reasons I, I try to show the graphs there, and it's a point that I try to make a lot. Republicans often make the argument that Democrats want to raise your taxes, we want to lower your taxes. In but what in actual fact, Republicans have consistently raised our taxes to lower them on the top percent. So it doesn't. We're not really talking about a raising taxes. The middle class and the working class should, in my opinion, get a tax cut. It should not go up for them. Yeah. You know, uh, it, 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 but it should go up for the top earners because that's the only way to rebalance the economy overall. All right. So the, the next question is about universal basic income. Um, Nathan asks, how do you answer the argument that universal basic income will pay everyone to be lazy and that no one would go to work? How would you respond to that argument? Uh, simply put, there's been tons of studies of this going back well over a century where they, we have implemented this. Uh, what you end up with, with a lot of the current approaches to uh, welfare spending is you have people feeling that they're being checked up on constantly. They have to do things. There's a, a bureaucratic element. It all seems to be like contingent and means tested. So people are sort of like anxious and worried about it. And it can actually discourage people from getting work because they may be afraid to lose their unemployment benefits and take the risk there. Maybe if they're on unemployment and getting Medicaid or something, they're a little bit better off than if they take a chance getting a job and then lose that job again. Um, what we've seen in UBI studies is that it actually increases people's self-confidence. It lets them want to contribute more, and they are more likely to get jobs and more likely to contribute positively in the economy than less. So the simple answer is there is empirical evidence for it, and we need to then stop believing people's you know, BS arguments against it. Yeah, and I almost think that this, this notion that of, of government handouts and giving people money from the state is going to make them lazy. Uh, that seems like more of a mythology. Uh, it's, it seems like, so, and, and to be quite honest, I think a lot of it is informed by entity. Uh, uh, there, there are lots of parts in the Bible that condemn uh, indolence and, and lazy, this, you know, from both uh, Liam and, and, and I teach American history and the examples abound of, of, uh, white Christians encountering Native Americans and, and, and saying, well, the Native Americans don't use land efficiently. They're uncivilized and uh, they're lazy. And so, uh, you know, I think that that argument about laziness has, has a lot of problematic assumptions that are, that are tied into a discourse that we don't accept today. And I also want to relate it to uh, people who get very outraged about welfare that, uh, oh, you know, uh, welfare and what they used to call aid to families with dependent children. It's going to encourage uh, laziness. But, you know, compare the dollar amounts there to the, um, I think someone else, it might have been Kate uh, uh, or Liz talking about uh, subsidies to oil companies. Again, tax breaks, uh, lobbyists, uh, stock buybacks, and all, all the loopholes that the, that the rich get. I think that if you compare dollar by dollar, um, you know, it's those advantages to the wealthy that you should really be outraged about, you know, not this notion about UBI and making people lazy. Uh, and one final point about that, you know, Henry George made this point in the late 19th century that as technology gets better, we're supposed to have more leisure. So we should have more leisure time, more time to spend with our families. Uh, people are suffering from anxiety and depression. We're not hanging out um, with, uh, uh, with people. So maybe one of the advantages of UBI is that, you know, we're not as much of an overworked uh, society any longer. So we need to ask ourselves with all these technological advancements, why is it that we, um, we don't have as much leisure time, you know, time to pursue our arts and our hobbies. The, those are the type of things that, that complete us as human beings. And, and we should try to design our policy to, to go after those goals in my mind. I, I honestly, I love that, uh, Dr. Campbell mentioned uh, the myth, the term myth here, because when you talk about this idea of like, you know, lazy people or whatever, chasing after handouts, it just reminds me of a lot of like Victorian anti-poor rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me too of like the whole 
Horatio Alger, up from nothing, rags to riches mm -hmm. sort of mythology that's been a part of the American fabric going back into the 19th century, but has never been empirically accurate. Mm -hmm. The simple fact is it's not worked. There's evidence, but it's a compelling story. It touches on certain archetypes. It makes people feel a certain way. And as Dr. Campbell mentioned, it does touch on like some biblical elements as well. So it resonates despite making no actual empirical sense. And the leisure comment is a good one, too, because economists have been predicting since like John Stuart Mill in the middle of the 19th century, uh, John Maynard Keynes in the middle of the 20th century, pointing out that as automation increases, we will have more and more free time to enjoy our families. What has happened is we create bullshit jobs, we create a sense of economic <laughs> insecurity, we tie people into the, the working systems here and keep the wages so low that they can't survive with less work, so we're not actually getting any of the benefits of the economy itself. It's simply put, we're being terrible capitalists. Right, so the, the final question that we'll take for today will be about, um, it's about the tools that were, were used. So the question is, um, if today's recession is unique and it's self-imposed or we should say um, imposed by the circumstances in the uh, digital health conditions, why are lawmakers only looking back to 2008, 2009 for tools to use primarily? Um, Congress has been reluctant to go beyond um, one stimulus check for people and uh, people have been waiting for over two months for unemployment checks. What is it that we can do differently, and why is this such a sticking point in, uh, in the minds of lawmakers? Yes, Ms. Okay. I was just going to say, I think that's why we're all running, is because we don't think that our current government knows how to handle unique situations and think nice. outside the box. You know, we can't, you, we can't continue to repeat the same things over and over again and think that we'll get different results or use the same results on a different situation. And I'll, I, yes, there's people who, like myself, who have been without pay for like over 12 weeks now, you know, about 10, 11, 12 weeks and our system's broken. So, you know, you need to look at every level of office, look at the people who actually care about what's going on with everyday people and help get them elected. Because, you know, if we go into, you know, the next, uh, the next year and we have the same people in office, we're going to be making the same mistakes again. Yeah. I, I just add that they, they do that largely because it avoids the need for real systemic reform. It benefits the current financial sector, and they don't have to really change anything. We have to address 40 years of mistakes in the way our economy is managed. And by going back only to that, they can benefit the markets, save the markets, and continue to ignore the decline in the real economy and the decline in our standard of living. All right. I would just like to add to that, uh, to Liam and Liz, that uh, it also, I think, highlights and reinforces the institutionalized racism in our society. Um, you know, if you are black or brown, you're more likely to be an essential frontline worker. You're more likely, therefore, to contract COVID-19 and to die from it. And you're more likely to lose your home in a foreclosure or be evicted from your rental. So... You know, again, I think that the system supporting itself and being so rigidly uh, resistant to any form of change uh, always includes that very, very large component of institutionalized racism and taking advantage, exploiting the essential workers and the communities of color who are most heavily impacted uh, during both a pandemic and an economic recession. Oops. So unless we have uh, no more responses to that, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of a wrap up and then we'll talk about next week's episode. Um, we're going to go backwards from our introductions. We're going to start with Kate, then Liz and Liam, and then Stephen will get the last word. Thank you. Okay, I am unmuted. Again, Kate Schwartz, I am running for Assembly District 75 seat against my Republican incumbent, who was also the Assembly Minority Leader, Marie Waldron. I wanted to discuss an article uh, actually written by uh, Stephen Bradford, who is one of our state senators. 
and he discusses uh, in recovering from the coronavirus, uh, California must achieve a more equitable economy. And uh, I would simply like to make a few points. Uh, again, if you are uh, a community of color, black or brown, you are still less likely to benefit from existing relief programs that could protect your home or your business, and you are less likely to be counted in our testing and in infection data. You are less likely to be supported despite being in need, just like many others. Um, when Congress included the $377 billion in small business assistance in the CARES Act, who actually benefited? Much of that went to large businesses who often missed out. Small businesses, especially businesses with minority women, disabled veterans, and LGBT owners. Uh, it took the intervention of the Congressional Black Caucus and others to change this in the subsequent round of funding. Uh, and uh, let me just finish with, uh, you know, there are, uh, there will be additional proposals to help Californians during this crisis, um, including a, a couple of bills. One helps tenants in subsidized housing build their credit, that's Senate Bill 1157, and another extends homeowner protections against foreclosures to tenant-occupied properties, and that's Senate Bill 1447. We know that the coronavirus crisis is far from over. Um, some people say that uh, you know we're, we're doing far too much in terms of our assistance uh, and are condemning some of the actions of Sac uh, in Sacramento, and others uh, feel we're doing too little. Um, but uh, during this period of uncertainty, um, I wanted to quote the wisdom of the late congressman and civil rights leader Elijah Cummings. He said, the cost of doing nothing isn't nothing, especially for those who started off miles behind others. All our responses to this crisis, including this proposal, must recognize that. Otherwise, we'll simply recover the same inequitable economy we had before. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Liz. She's still, Liz, can you hear us? Oh, I think she's uh, she had to get off. So we'll go to Liam. Okay, so I'm I'm simply going to say that I I am running because I am tired of policymakers slapping band aids on a hemorrhage. We just chase after surface effects, and we get involved in all this tribal politics, chasing after individual pieces of the pie, and ignoring so much of the deeper structural underlying issues. Uh, my entire platform is essentially built around a recognition that for half a century we've been going in the wrong direction and harming ordinary people and all the different policies connect together because there is an overall problem that we have to start talking about. Uh, it's just my personal belief that public policy should, you know, follow the evidence and not ideology. So um, if that's appealing to you, then uh, Liam O'Mara for Congress, liamomara.org. Um, I'm very easy to find on Twitter, Facebook, all that business there. Hope you'll sign up for the campaign. Thank you. All right, Dr. Campbell, you get the last word. Thank you. All right, that's a lot of pressure. Um, thank you again. And I hearing some of these Proposals about Medicare for All and Postal Banking, a Green New Deal, I wholeheartedly support and reinforce those. Um, you know, a lot of us were talking about the 40-year project of, of Reaganomics and neoliberalism, sometimes it's called. Um, you know, it's going to take a lot of hard work uh, also of, of, of building up institutions. Um, this isn't going to happen overnight. Um, if we want to deal with inequality, uh, we got to get money out of politics. Uh, I mentioned Citizens United before. Our members of Congress, they spend many hours of days, unfortunately, going across the street from the Capitol uh, to beg rich people for money. Uh, I can't tell you personally how much it infuriates me that, uh, and this was especially true under John Boehner, but also uh, a little bit under Nancy Pelosi's leadership of, you know, taking vacations when, uh, you know, you feel like the nation is falling apart. Uh, they should be in Washington more often. Uh, you know, the right over the past four decades has built up institutions through talk radio and the Federalist Society that do not have any uh, equivalents on the left. Um, 
you know, state budgets, somebody was talking before about uh, firing teachers, cops, and firefighters. Uh, they were doing that around 2009, 2010. And that's because state governments can't run budget deficits. Well, maybe that should change too. Because when these cataclysmic recessions happen, uh, it's only the federal government that can run deficits. Uh, maybe we should seek to change that. Uh, and one more policy I want to emphasize ha has to do with how corporations are run. And it relates to the, uh, the tax cuts that have been packed is called uh, stock buybacks. <sighs> During the, uh, the sort of New Deal Keynesian years, the Security and Exchange Commission regulated corporations. They prevented them from buying back their own shares. Uh, they called it market manipulation. Ronald Reagan comes in, and Don Regan is the Secretary of Treasury, and Don Regan uh, in 1982 says that we're going to allow corporations to buy back their own shares. Now, why is this so destructive? Because, for one, uh, it makes the investor class richer uh, because it artificially raises the price of stock, uh, and that's how uh, the wealthy get their money. They're, they're not getting their money through wages. They're getting their money through stocks, uh, capital gains, and whatnot. Um, but, it, but the stock buyback takes money away from reinvestment in, in wages and technology. So when Liam was showing those graphs about uh, productivity, you know, going up, but, but wages are not compensating, one of the, you know, there are about five or six different reasons why we have that. But one of them is stock buybacks. Um, I think we need to really get rid of uh, stock buybacks. But again, uh, this isn't going to happen overnight. It's, we're we're going to have to be at this for the, uh, the long haul. So I'll, I'll conclude by saying that. And, and again, uh, this was a very healthy discussion, and I, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming, participating with us. Thank you all for participating again. Um, we've appreciated you having, here, having you here as we do every week. So next week, we're going to be talking about disabilities rights. We have two incredible guests. We have uh, Amanda Seavey, who was a former uh, candidate for Congress, but it's also she's incredibly knowledgeable on the subject, so we'll be really excited. And we have uh, Chanel, Chanel Pittman, who will be with us. And and we look forward to a great discussion on disability rights. Sooner or later, we all have some kind of issue problem where we need some kind of accommodation. So we need to look at this through a holistic prism, and it's going to be fantastic. Until then, stay safe, wear your masks, and, uh, do, uh, and keep on doing the best you can. We'll all get there together. Great.